brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios, sponsored by Mazda. Hello and welcome to Future Energy Talks with me, Andrew Wilson. Artificial intelligence sits right at the top of today's corporate agenda and with good reason. Its ability to transform every part of business is still being realised. But a new question might be, does it have the potential to help to reduce carbon emissions and mitigate climate change? That's what we're set to explore next, so do stay with us. So far, much of the world's response to the decarbonisation challenge has been to focus on the hardware, building low-carbon infrastructures to replace decades-old carbon-intensive systems. But is it perhaps AI and digital technology that will truly revolutionise energy transition? Powering through data models and adopting large-scale changes more quickly and efficiently than removing physical systems. So joining me to answer this question and more is Belinda Howell. She is, among her other titles, non-executive director at Digital Catapult, as well as managing director of Decarbonize Limited. Belinda, great to see you. Thanks for talking to us today. Thank you. First of all, give us a quick whip round those two organisations that you work with. OK, so first of all, uh, Digital Catapult is the UK's centre for um, advanced digital technology innovation, um, and its aim is to help accelerate uh, the success of um, early stage digital technology all the way through the innovation cycle to commercialization at the end of the day. Um, my day job is also uh, as managing director of Decarbonize. It's a sustainability strategy consultancy and we work with large companies helping them to define what uh, that journey looks like for uh, sustainability and moving towards net zero and a circular economy and identify the clean tech companies that can help work with them to provide the solutions to do that. I imagine this is a space that's particularly busy at the moment. Is it one that's filled with positive energy or one that's filled with resignation and gloom? Oh, I think full, full of positive energy um, because the, we, we know about the science, we know uh, where the technologies are, we have the technologies at our fingertips, we just need to put it all together and make it happen and deliver. So AI is poised to really start playing a significant role in our ambitions to reduce carbon emissions. It plays a really significant role. Um, it's a contributory role. It's an enabling factor, if you like, right across all other sectors to help them achieve their net zero targets. Energy sector particularly is already trying to cut down the amount of energy it uses, and there's a lot of data analysis involved in that. One hopes that other sectors will make the same sort of moves, and AI makes that a simpler or a more effective process, does it? Um, it can do. So with, uh, for example, the building sector, uh, construction is responsible for 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions, um, once you include the steel and the cement, etc. So where AI can help is to help with energy efficiency, for example, with smart meters and sensors um, installed, um, you also need to insulate those buildings um, to help them reduce their energy use. And then other digital technologies, um, AI algorithms will calculate the data um, that comes from the sensors and feed those into energy management systems or can feed into other, other technologies on a production line, for example, to, to help them perform with, with greater energy efficiency and therefore lower cost. So is it an up, a simple upscale of what a lot of people are trying to do in their homes with the smart meters and the allocation mm -hmm. of renewable energy and, uh, and using batteries sometimes? It's, it's a little bit more than that. That's certainly where you would want to start. Um, but as we go forward, um, most people in their homes have gas, not really so much oil these, these days, but certainly gas central heating, for example. Um, so that takes up to 30% of um, the UK's greenhouse gas emissions is actually heating buildings, not just homes, but all buildings. Um, that's a big chunk that we need to deal with. For this reason, because um, gas boilers produce carbon dioxide when, when they're working, oil and gas boilers are being phased out of new homes from 2025, so really quite soon. Um, and then the rest of us with our existing gas boilers will need to start to change those over. 
The answer is to first of all insulate buildings to reduce that energy demand and use and make them more efficient. Um, use those smart meters but then also to electrify everything else um, so that new technologies like air source heat pumps can be fitted and um, retrofitted into buildings that's far more efficient than burning in your old gas boiler. But as soon as you say electricity to the homeowner as well as to the business owner, they immediately think, well, that's going to be expensive. I mean, what role can AI play in reducing the cost of the energy that people need to consume? So what it can do is for decentralised, intermittent, renewable energy systems like solar, like wind, um, it can um, balance the supply and the demand. Um, so when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining, um, those technologies can be collecting that energy stored in batteries or in different devices. It might be your electric vehicle or your electric boiler or in battery storage or fuel storage ready for when, um, when it's ready to be used by the user. Balancing that supply and demand helps reduce um, the overall energy use and, and the cost and stabilises the grid as well. There's the corporate world and then there's the way people live their lives and they're both crucial in terms of management of energy, cost of energy and conserving energy. Taking that example of insulation then, is AI capable of creating a system which would take a snapshot of perhaps a town or a street or the way people live and make recommendations about how those buildings could be upgraded or how the systems or infrastructure could be changed effectively to reduce the carbon emissions from that simple dwelling area? Yes, I think it's got a really, um, really good role to play. Um, and it might not just be AI again, it may be wider digital heat sensing technologies, for example, um, that can demonstrate how much heat we are losing. Because in the UK, we've got a very aging housing stock, if you like. Um, it's very leaky, it's losing a lot of heat. And really the first thing you want to do is to, to insulate it. But to make the case for how much energy we're losing, how much that's costing us um, and how much heat that's, that's losing. Um, I think digital technologies can provide the sensing that demonstrate that and that can go to government, for example, who has in the past set, set really good targets for zero emission um, houses, zero carbon buildings, things like that. Um, but those seem to have slightly withered on the vine and I think with the strength of that sort of evidence that um, AI and digital can bring um, that can uh, deliver the, the reasons for actually setting really strong policies and t targets in this area. So, so I suppose it, for, a, for a company it might divide itself into two priorities. One will be your own infrastructure, mm -hmm. get advice or look again at how to streamline how that works. Yeah. And the other will be the infrastructures that aren't yours but surround what it is you do, whatever it is you do. Yeah. And that that must be a, a, more a process of negotiation or partnership or cooperation with outside organisations. Very much so. So very often companies, you'll hear them refer to scope three and what they mean is sort of all the other stuff that's out of our control, that's either in our supply chain upstream or, or downstream towards our, our customers. Um, but that's all part of their overall carbon footprint, if you like. There's technologies called um, distributed ledger technology that helps trace all the way through the supply chain from where a raw material is produced, track it all the way through uh, manufacturing the supply chain to the company and then to where it's, it's sold to the consumer. And those are the sorts of different digital technologies we'd use for traceability as well and provenance. Uh, so you've got the kind of verification of provenance kind of procedure That's going it. on there as well. Yeah. At the same time, that's something that a lot of companies use to boost their ESG credentials, often with just simple claims or promises and so on. Does that kind of verification play into handling carbon offsets and the sort of how that plays into companies' ESG models? Um, it can do. I think it has a very important role to play. Um, as, as you imply, um, carbon offsets, carbon credits, particularly in voluntary carbon markets, have been somewhat discredited by um, by, frankly, some fairly sharp practices going on. So I think if, we, if we're using digital technology, if we're using things like GIS, distributed ledger technologies, um, a more common name that you might hear for that, which isn't the generic name, is blockchain. So that's an example of a, a distributed ledger technology. Um, if that can trace all the way through from the source of a carbon credit um, all the way through to uh, where that carbon 
credits bought and then it's taken off the market and that's in a controlled market, then that can give it much better provenance than the carbon credits and offsets that have been rightly criticised. A lot of people feel sometimes they, they look at the private sector and think, well, they're making advances here, but legislation is lagging behind or the government is promising this and the private sector is doing that. I mean, do you think there's a need for in the decarbonisation programme worldwide, more coordination between private sector and government? Absolutely. I think it's completely essential um, that there's, there's more uh, collaboration and cooperation between governments and industry. Um, let, let me give you some evidence of how that can work. Um, in the early 1980s, scientists discovered um, the hole in the ozone layer, in the stratospheric ozone layer. Uh, published in Nature, the scientific journal, in 1985. It was British Antarctic Survey scientists. By 1987, two years later, the Montreal Protocol had been agreed, which was an international agreement between governments, international governments, national governments, um, and the industry um, and businesses on uh, stopping production and consumption of ozone-depleting substances because the science was really clear. There was a direct line from one thing to the other. Scan forward and they were actually, businesses were actually given a clear track of how to do that. By 2019, um, the hole in the ozone layer was the smallest since it was first discovered. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from there about um, governments um, taking the lead from scientists from, and scientists publishing their data being really clear about what the evidence is, government's taking the lead and following with international agreements, so there's no slippage, there's no undermining of that between different countries or different industries, and then industry having a clear pathway to follow, collaborating with the governments and delivering on, on those reductions. That's the challenge, really, in a way, isn't it? Because Montreal Protocol had two advantages. One, it got results that could be measured quite quickly, relatively speaking, and also there was a very clear way forward that could be actioned with fairly straightforward legislation without too much pain on anyone's part. The decarbonisation programme is a more complicated challenge, but are we getting to the point where we can sell a clarity, a scientific clarity that can be legislated by government without poisoning its position with the general public? I think we absolutely can. Um, we have the science now that shows us where we are. At Paris in 2015, we signed up to 1.5 degrees, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. By the way, we're not doing too well on that. We're already on 1.1 degree. And we are measuring the carbon emissions and we know where they are in, in terms of the atmosphere and we know the trajectories. We are seeing the climate change come through as a result and how that's matching with the science as well. In fact, if anything, it's been rather conservative. Um, because we are seeing things like global sea temperatures this week alone um, peaking at a time where global sea temperatures shouldn't be peaking. So the science is clear, um, we know what we need to do about it um, and we know that we need to stop uh, burning fossil fuels first and foremost um, but a whole uh, range of other things that, that need to happen around that. That's the importance of this COP28 that these series of talks are preparing for because it enables governments to have that, those conversations with industry and follow the science and put in place really ambitious targets and action programmes. And when it comes to those governments' questions about AI, bringing it back to the, the technology question again, um, it's, it's feasible and, it, and, and in, indeed enjoyable almost to explain the possibilities of AI in terms of all this energy management programmes that are coming up for people to deal with. Um, when the question comes along, so do we let go of the reins and let AI handle all of this? Or what is the human element in all this going forward? Where's the second check? How will that balance evolve, do you think? That, that's a really interesting question. I think um, we all know that AI and other digital technologies have, have huge opportunities and huge advantages to bring, bring to us. Um, they have their downsides as well. So um, on the human side of things, I think um, we're probably not there yet, are we, in terms of understanding really the equality and the ethical um, frameworks that we need to put around AI and other digital technologies, almost to provide us with some guardrails um, to, to make sure that those don't have unintended con consequences. Um, so I think it's really important that 
that the digital industry and the governments again, you know, put heads together and develop um, regulations, standards, guidelines, whatever they are, that are, are forward thinking, but also precautionary in nature. Does, does artificial intelligence or even a more sophisticated analysis of data, does that make the scientific case more persuadable and therefore give it more influence in terms of government and political negotiations about how to move society forward or how to make changes in legislation? I think what it can do is give us the real evidence of um, what's happening in practice and, um, if you like, tell truth to power uh, about that so that we have the evidence to deliver um, where heat is being wasted or where there's deforestation going on, etc., etc., that can be delivered to governments. Governments then know where to, where to set policies, where to set targets and businesses to ensure that those things don't happen and to, to help decarbonisation. Looking at the, the examples you've brought up, and particularly the one of the oceans and the Antarctica is something that's going to be talked about a lot over the next few months. So given that there'll be another push surrounding COP28, perhaps, where there's these, these topics become something worth public consideration again, uh, and that balance between technology and data analysis and artificial intelligence against the willingness of governments to act and the private sector to push projects forward, are you optimistic about the next five, ten years? Because they're an important, it's going to be an important decade, isn't it? It's a, it's a vitally important decade. It's kind of our last chance to, to get this and, and to, to take the bull by the horns, for want of a better phrase, um, and, and actually start turning words into action. I think that's, that's the point at which we are. We, we know we've got the technologies, the digital technologies, the renewable technologies, new clean technology for heavy industry um, coming through. Um, we know what the science is and it's telling us to do. And so I think it's really the time for talking is over. Collaboration, yes, but actually we need to move to, to fast action across industries and across all countries and, and regions to, to deliver on what we need to deliver. In terms of solutions and in terms of problem solving, is artificial intelligence something where you can feed in all your issues? We've got a carbon problem, we've got a temperature problem, we've got an oceans problem, and then sit back and it will create a kind of formula of success and survival for you. Can you, is it that hands-off? Um, it's really not that hands-off um, and it can't do it on its own. Um, one of the things that's really interesting that it can do though is um, different kinds of, of technologies. So um, a digital catapult, for instance, we've got the digital twins. So what you're doing there is you're modelling whether it's an earth system and how that's behaving or um, some kind of production line, if you like. And you're modelling how that might work in practice and comparing it and then trying different, um, different factors on that to see how it responds. So I think it can help, help us find the way through I don't think it can deliver the answer on its own because we're going to still need huge investment in, in infrastructure and in that hardware of, um, of business and industry um, that will need upgrading. Final thought then, you know, we've talked very generally about AI and we all imagine what it can do. Can you give me a sort of forensic example of how AI steps in and plays a role that's been clumsily managed thus far? in terms of managing the costs of energy or the, or the management yeah. of energy itself? Okay, so, um, so a good example would be, um, back, back to something we referred to earlier, managing the grid, help, helping to manage the grid. So this whole electrification that's going to happen is going to demand a doubling in, in electricity use, but also in, um, in its transmission across networks. Right, so that's going to require an upscale, a, a dramatic upscale in our electricity uh, distribution nets, tra transmission distribution networks. Um, where AI, and as I say, other digital technologies, it might be some machine learning, it might be some 5G, um, can come in is about connecting those decentralized intermittent sources of renewable energy with the energy users um, and helping to stabilize the grid um, so that it can cope with this massive expansion um, and actually bring the, the uh, renewable energy is in from when, when it's offshore wind, it's coming from some distance away um, into the major energy centres um, and make that all, all work. And I don't think that could happen 
at all or certainly not efficiently without the various digital technologies that are going to need to deliver that. Belinda Howe, absolute pleasure. Thanks okay. so much for coming and talking to us. Thank you. Belinda Howell there, revolutionary stuff on how AI will help transform our energy systems. If you'd like to understand some of the other pioneering solutions to climate change, then it's worth listening to our other podcasts in this series. I'm Andrew Wilson, and this is Future Energy Talks, streaming now. Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios, sponsored by Mazda.